This is going to be our first lecture of Module 3. In this lecture, we're going to be going over the general requirements of Article 300. So our objectives for this lesson, we're going to identify general wiring requirements for equipment and wiring methods, understand the NEC requirements for underground installations, use Table 300.5 to list minimum cover requirements, list support methods for raceways and cables, and use Table 300.19a to list conductor support spacing. For definitions, we have board. Um, now when I say board, I'm talking in terms of making a hole in something, um, as in boring a hole, and that's explanatory by the definition here. It appears with a turning or twisting movement of a tool. Underground, which is, of course, beneath the surface of the earth. Backfill to refill something such as an excavation, usually with excavated material. And ferrous, uh, we've had this term come up in a couple of our previous lectures, especially in Module 2 with grounding and bonding. But ferrous means of or relating to or containing iron. Uh, typically, when we talk about ferrous materials um, in regard to the NEC or the electrical field, we're saying it does contain iron. So Article 300 is general requirements for wiring methods uh, and materials. This article is going to be starting on page 134 of a 2017 NEC codebook. So Article 300 covers general wiring methods for all installations unless modified by another article. Now, you may notice this sounds really broad. Article 300 is a very broad article. It bounces around to a lot of different topics and ideas a lot. It's kind of a, a conglomerate of a lot of different requirements and ideas. So we will be bouncing around a lot. Wiring methods covered in Chapter 3 are for 1,000 volts nominal or less, unless otherwise limited. Um, and notice this is not saying... Uh, article 300, this is talking about all of Chapter 3, so all our different wiring methods that we talk about uh, in Chapter 3, you know, whether it be AC cable, N MC cable, NM cable, EMT, uh, RMC, PVC, all those are for 1,000 volts or less, unless they otherwise limit it. So we have some wiring methods covered in Chapter 3 that may be limited to only 6,000 volts nominal or less, or 240 volts nominal or less. Now we do have some that are permitted for over 1,000 volts where they are specified as being permitted for 1,000 volts. Um, but unless we have something specifically saying we can use it for under, for over 1,000 volts, any of the wiring methods in Chapter 3 are for under 1,000 volts only. So starting off here, we're going to be looking at conduct the general requirements for some conductor installations. Single conductors listed in Table 310.104a must be installed as part of a wiring method. Uh, these single conductors we're referring to here are going to be your typical everyday conductors such as THHN, THWN, XHHW. You know, you think you're single individual conductors. We have to install those in some type of wiring method. We can't just run those on a wall or in a ceiling and support them. You know, they have to be in some type of conduit or a cable tray or part of some type of cable assembly. All conductors for the same circuit must be contained in the same wiring method unless permitted by 300.3B1 through 4. In other words, if we have, take a typical uh, 120 volts uh, circuit that has just a current carrying conductor a grounded or neutral conductor and an equipment grounding conductor, uh, in other words, a black watt and a green wire, we have to have all three of those wires in that same wiring method. So if we're using uh, NM cable for an example, we can't run two pieces of NM and use the black wire as our current carrying conductor in one of the cables and then use the neutral and the grounding conductor uh, out of the other cable for one circuit. They would all have to be part of the same cable. And same idea if we're installing them in conduit. We can't run two separate conduits, one for the hot and one for the neutral, and then another one for the ground. They have to be in the same conduit. The only exceptions we have to this are the 300.3B1 through 4, which are for parallel installations. Obviously, 
the whole concept of parallel is we're going to have multiple cables or multiple raceways to feed the same piece of equipment. Uh, for grounding and bonding conductors, we do have uh, exceptions that allow us to actually run on the outside of a cable or a conductor for the grounding or the bonding conductor. Non-ferrous wiring methods, in other words, under certain circumstances, if we're using, say, PVC conduit or an M cable, we do have some certain specific exceptions to when we can use them in that method. And for column width panel board enclosures, we have some specific exceptions for those as well in regards to this 300.3B rule. Now for different systems, this is sticking kind of with the same idea of conductor installations, but from a kind of a little bit of a different standpoint. Conductors for different circuits are permitted to be in the same raceway or cable. The installation of all conductors must be rated for the higher, highest voltage of any circuit. In other words, <coughs> if we take a typical installation we see a lot of times using uh, EMT conduit, uh, if we happen to have two or three circuits that are in the same pathway of that EMT, we'll usually pull all two or three of those circuits in the same conduit, the same piece of EMT, and then drop them off as we hit those circuits. And that's what uh, 300.3C1 here is telling us is that we're permitted to do that. The only rule we have to this is that the installation of all of them, of every conductor in that same cable or in that same conduit, have to be equally rated for the highest voltage of any of the circuits. In other words, if we have a 480 volt circuit in that conduit, but the other circuits of the conduit are operating at 120 volts, those 120 volt circuits have to use insulation for the conductors that are good for up to at least 480 volts in that situation. Conductors over 1,000 volts nominal cannot be in the same raceway or cable as conductors under 1,000 volts unless permitted in 300.3 C2A through D. Um, in other words, 300.3 C1 tells us that uh, we can have circuits of different voltages in the same conduit or cable, but we do have one rule to that stated here in 300.3 uh, C2, which is if they're operating at over a thousand volts, we can't have them with conductors over a thousand, under a thousand volts. I mentioned before the NEC uh, draws a lot of lines between conductors at or under a thousand volts and over a thousand volts. This is another example of that. So here's kind of a little picture of what I was talking about with uh, conductors being in the same raceway or cable, all having to have the same rating of insulation for the high circuit. So we can see here, these orange and yellow conductors and the brown are operating at 480 volts. And they're in the same raceway as this black and white wire operating at 120 volts. And in order to make this code compliant, you can see all of these conductors have insulation, which is rated for 600 volts. And 600 volts is typically the standard insulation that we see for our normal everyday conductors. Your THHN, THWN. Those are typically going to be rated for up to 600 volts. Your typical electrical tape that you'd buy at a uh, electrical supply store, that's usually going to be rated for up to 600 volts. Switching from our individual conductor ideas here, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about cables and conduits now. Where cables or raceway are installed through board holes, once again, this means you know, drilled, in other words, we've made a hole in something, must be made a an inch and a quarter from the edge. In other words, if we take a typical um, place we see this at would be in a residential building, a home, uh, we'll drill holes through the two by four stud framing to run our cables in. We need to drill that hole to where the outside edge of that hole is an inch and a quarter from the edge of that two by four. And what this typically means for a two by four is you have to make that hole in the center of the stud. Where the distance can't be made, plates or bushings, at least a 16th inch thick must be used. Uh, back to a residential uh, example, this is typically when we would use nail plates for those of you that have seen those or used them. You can also use the bushings they're referring to would just pop into the hole and they essentially add another layer of protection. Uh, you have to think in the residential example, the whole idea of this is we don't want someone to drive a screw or a nail 
through the sheetrock, presumably sheetrock or other finished material, through the stud wall and into the cable. Cables and raceways may be installed in wooden notches if protected by plates at least 1 16th inch thick. Um, in other words, instead of boring a hole in that same two by four, we could make a notch on one side of the two by four to install the cable or the raceway in, but we would have to go back to using that nail plate or something similar to that in order to protect it. Sticking with our cable and conduit installations now, we're gonna be talking about those a little bit more. Non-metallic cables that pass through slots or holes in metal members must be protected by listed bushings or grommets. What they're referring to by metal members here is gonna be you're using metal studs. If you've ever worked in a uh, commercial building such as an office and they've actually started using them in residential as well. We have a picture on our next slide that'll show a little bit more about what I'm talking about here. Where it's likely screws may penetrate the cables or raceways, a plate or clip not less than 16th inch thick must be used. You'll see the NEC use this term where it is likely quite a bit. In reality, this is up to the um, decision of the AHG, AHJ whether something is likely or not. Um, you typically have to use just kind of a common sense call on whether or not it makes sense that something may be, uh, for this situation, a screw may penetrate it in a given situation, what the likelihood that someone would uh, do that is, for instance, in a home, it's a lot more likely that up to six feet, a screw or a nail may penetrate a cable that's installed in a wall, uh, since that would be more likely to be where you would hang maybe a picture or a TV from, versus if it were installed at eight feet close to the ceiling, it would be a lot less likely. So here are pictures here. You can see on the left-hand side, we have some NM cable uh, non-metallic cable being installed through some two by four studs. And we can see for this particular installation, they did have to install those nail plates over the front of the studs. On our right here, you can see some NM cable being installed through some metal studs and they're using those insulating bushings that we talked about. That's just to prevent the cable from getting damaged on the edge of the stud. So now we're gonna be continue kind of to talk about uh, mainly conduit ideas here. We do have some other fittings that can fall into this realm as well, some specific requirements for those. Raceways that contain four gauge or larger conductors must use one of the following when entering an enclosure. So regardless of the size of the raceway, if we have four gauge conductors installed inside that raceway and we're terminating at an enclosure, whether it be a panel or a junction box or otherwise, we have to use one of these methods to protect those conductors. A fitting that provides a smooth insulated surface, a listed middle fitting with smooth rounded edges, separation from the fitting or raceway using an insulating material that's fastened in place, or threaded hubs or bosses that are integral to the enclosure that provide a smooth rounded or flared entry. The idea behind this is just once we get up to a four gauge conductor and larger, the conductor's heavy enough that if gravity forces it down onto the edge of that entry point or that fitting, uh, the conductor can actually eventually cut into its own insulation from its own weight pressing against that edge. So we want it to be something smooth and not sharp to where it won't do that over time. Uh, once again, this is just due to the weight once we get to a four gauge wire and larger. Moving on now, we're gonna be switching up and talking about underground insulation specifically, and this applies to both conduit and cables. We're, we have some specific requirements for cables, some specific requirements for conduits, and we have some that are general to both. Direct buried cables and raceways must be installed per table 300.5. We're gonna be taking a look at that table, I believe on the very next slide. The interior of enclosures or raceways installed underground is considered a wet location. This is important for us to know. Uh, run into a lot of times people will pull, say, NM cable or some other type of conductor that's only rated for a dry location in a raceway that's installed underground. As 300.5B tells us here, we can't do that because if they, if we do have, say, a raceway, whether you know PVC conduit installed underground, the inside of that raceway is considered a wet location. 
So thus we're required to use conductors that are rated for a wet location, such as THWN. Conductors and cables under a building must be installed in raceway. This is another rule we see uh, some issues run into a lot of times when we're using direct buried cable. Uh, if we go to pass under a building with that direct buried cable or say our panel that we're supplying those conductors with is located inside the building, the portion of that conductor that is under the building we have to install in raceway. Uh, and this just kind of prevent having to bust up the floor of the building or the foundation in order to get to that conductor if it's damaged later on. Uh, you can just dig up on the outside of the building in the dirt, pull it out, and then re-pull a new one in. And direct buried conductors and cables must be protected from damage per 300.5 D1 through 4. So we have some specific requirements uh, as far as protecting those cables. Some of these involve using certain types of backfill and otherwise. So this is our table 300.5. You can see this is called minimum cover requirements, zero to a thousand volts nominal uh, burial in millimeters and inches. So this is another pretty simple table for us to use. It does have a lot of parts to it. So on the left-hand side column here, we see location of wiring method or circuit. Below this, we have a variety of locations. So our very first one, we have all locations not specified below. We have entrench below two inch thick concrete or equivalent under a building, under a minimum of four inch thick concrete exterior slab with no vehicular traffic and so on. So the first step we want to take when we're using this table is we have to determine where are we installing our conductors at. So as an example, uh, I'm going to say that we're installing them on the third to last item under streets, highways, roads, alleys, driveways, and parking lots. The next thing we want to do is we want to figure out what type of wiring method we're using. So in our columns one through five, we can see for column one, we have direct burial cables or conductors. Column two, we have rigid metal conduit, conduit or intermediate metal conduit. And then column three, we have non-metallic raceways listed for direct burial without concrete encasement or other approved raceways. So once we figured out a wiring method, uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to say that we're going to be using column one, direct burial cable or conductors. All we're going to do is we're going to match that row and that column together. So our row is under streets, highways, roads, alleys, driveways, and parking lots. Our column is direct burial cables or conductors. And where those two meet at, we see we have 24 inches. So this means that we would have to, if we're installing direct burial cable under a street, highway, road, so on, we have to install those cables so that they are 24 inches below grade. For another example, if we look at under a building and we're using column, the same column, direct burial cables or conductors, we see that we don't have to install them under any amount of burial. We can actually just lay these flat and let the slab of the building or foundation, whatever it may be, cover them. We don't have to trench them. Now, typically in that situation, you'd have to trench it just enough so that your the top of the ditch is level with grade for the sake of how the foundation has to go on the building, but we don't have any specific burial requirements. Moving on, we have some more specific requirements for raceways. Where raceways are exposed to different temperatures and condensation is an issue, they must be sealed to prevent the warm air circulating to the cold section. Uh, we run into this a lot when we're dealing with uh, maybe some type of refrigerated building where certain temperatures are kept at a normal, you know, high 60 to low 70 degree temperature. And we have freezer areas where they can be below 30 degrees and we have the same conduit running between those two areas, it can cause condensation and moisture to start to build up. We have to seal those two, the inside of that raceway as well as the outside to prevent that from happening. And the sealants that we use for that have to be listed for use with the conductors and the cables. In other words, we can't just use any old type of sealant because they may cause damage to the insulation of the conductors.
Where needed, expansion or deflection fittings must be used with raceways due to thermal expansion. We run into this a lot when we install PVC um, exposed. Uh, PVC will expand and shrink with the heat and the cold, as most things do. Uh, if we don't have, uh, it's called an expansion fitting, installed with that, over time, that expansion and contraction will actually cause the PVC to pull apart. It'll pull out of its couplings or its fittings, uh, thus exposing the conductors that are installed within. So we install an expansion fitting or an expansion coupling, which essentially gives it room for that expansion and contraction to happen without damaging the rest of the system. Sticking with our raceways, we have some specificness when it comes to installing them in wet locations and for their required continuity. The interior of raceways installed above grade in a wet location is also considered a wet location. Uh, this kind of mirrors our rule about being installed underground, they're considered wet location. Uh, that's because and the underground rule kind of goes with this in that usually when something is, is installed below ground, below ground or underground is considered a wet location. So this rule kind of forces that rule to exist where when it's installed in a wet location, uh, the inside of it's considered a wet location. And metal raceway cable armor and other metal enclosures for conductors must be metallically continuous and connected to all boxes, fittings, enclosures, etc. This kind of goes back to our module two grounding and bonding where we talked about that a lot with using different types of conductors and or different types of conduits and cables as an equipment grounding conductor, so on and so forth. This kind of falls in that same thought process. For our last little point here for this lecture, we're gonna be talking about conductor supports. So conductors and vertical raceways must be supported per table 300.19A, and that's gonna be our next slide is that table. Um, now, obviously, if we have a conduit run straight up vertically for 100 feet, gravity is going to wanna to pull those conductors straight down, and we don't want that to happen, so we have specific rules for how we have to support those conductors so that they don't do that. At least one support must be provided for each conductor at the top of the raceway or as close as to, to top as practical. Intermediate supports must be provided as needed per table 300.19A. And support methods may be any means listed in 300.19C. So now taking a look at that table 300.19a, which is our spacings for conductor supports. So on the left hand column here under conductor size, we, have, we see we have a variety of different sizes, 18 gauge through 8 gauge, 6 gauge through 1 one aught, and so on. And then this next column tells us support of conductors in vertical raceways, and they're all labeled as not greater than. In other words, whatever length is given to us in our next columns over, we can't go further than that distance without supporting those conductors. So for an example, looking at our second row, six gauge through one aught, we see that for, and we have two column options under conductors, which are aluminum or copper. We can see for, cop, for aluminum or copper clad aluminum conductors, we can go up to 200 feet without supporting that conductor in a vertical run, but not greater than that of male. We see the same, that for copper, however, for the same size, it, we can only go 100 feet. And this is because, uh, for those of you that have worked with larger cable a decent bit at this point, copper conductors are much heavier than their aluminum equivalent. In other words, a one-aught copper conductor is much heavier than a one-aught aluminum conductor. So in other words, we need more support for that copper because it weighs more than the same size aluminum. For another example, if we go near the bottom at over 500 kc mil through 750 kc mil, we can see that for aluminum, we can go up to 95 feet without supporting it. For copper, we can go up to 40 feet. Now keep in mind, per our previous rule, we still have to have that, that support at the entrance at the top of the, the raceway. Uh, this does not alleviate us from that. 
Typically what you will do is you'll have your support at the top of the raceway and then you'll measure out your distance from that first support down and install intermediate supports as you need them. That concludes our first lecture for module one. In our next session, we're gonna be looking at conductor sizing and adjustment.